are all white people racist? Well, what's the answer to that? Yes and no, I think. Yeah. Is the West a white supremacist society? Yes and no. Is the US structurally racist? Yes and no. Is gender fluid? Yes and no. Mm. Are all men sexist? Yes and no. And, and I believe the yes and no answers to both of those. And so let's start with this racism issue. So mm. one of the things I kind of outlined in Maps of Meaning, I think, is that there are two sources of virulent racism. And one is universal, as far as I can tell, looking at the anthropological literature. Mm. So one of the things you see that's characteristic of human societies, regardless of their size and location, is that there's a strong proclivity for the members of those societies to regard those within the society as human, this is particularly mm -hmm. true of, you can particularly see this in isolated tribes, as human and all other humans that aren't in the tribal group as not human. Mm -hmm. And that's really, it seems really deeply rooted. And so, you even see it in chimpanzees, mm. our closest biological relative. So the chimps arrange themselves so that they can function within their own troop, let's mm -hmm. say, without tearing each other into pieces, except on occasion. But the chimps will send raiding parties of males around the boundaries, essentially. And if they encounter non-chimp chimps, mm -hmm. foreigners, let's say, even if they were once part of that troop and had moved, mm. If they outnumber them, they'll often tear them to pieces. And that's a, that was discovered in the 1970s, and it was a major discovery because it showed how deeply rooted this in-group, out-group differentiation is, you know, that it mm -hmm. manifests itself even in our closest animal relative. And so if you say, are all white people racist? The answer to that is probably yes. Mm -hmm. But the corollary is, well, that's probably true of all people. In America... The in-group would be like Americans and then out-group would be like foreigners, you know, but it's not that it's like it's white people and then black people, even though we all live right next to each other. And like this is like a global thing, because even if you go to even in even in Africa, they look at um, white people as like up on a pedestal. So that's not even like the, the in-group preference. That's like an out-group preference, which is like damaging. Asia, they have like colorism, too, because um, if you're darker skin, that means you're like a laborer. So you're lower class. I brought up that argument classroom teacher that was segregating her class some students from blue eyes to brown eyes and then she switched it the other week blue, brown eyes to blue eyes where she segregated and gave them less benefits and all that stuff and she noticed a change in the kids behavior and the whole idea was that you know because they were discriminated against they were starting to be racist to each other and that's the idea like is it really the preference that's causing this you know distinguishing between classes or is it the classes distinguishing that causes the prejudice and the preferences so that's something that we can look into. Correct. And so it's, it's the problem with the proposal that all white people are racist is that the fact that a skin color is listed in the proposition, it's a political move and it, it decreases, it, it underplays the critical severity of the problem. Yes. Right? Like if it's, it's just a, white people, that's, that's yeah. not a big problem. But if it's all people, and even our yeah. closest relatives, it's like, man, we've got something to overcome. And then this is more relevant to what you said, I would say, is given that intrinsic in-group preference and out-group hatred that could easily be kindled, and that might be there like deep and even from the beginning, are there ways that we act as individuals that make that more and less likely? Mm -hmm. And that has more to do, I think, with the psychological development issue that you were describing. So if I'm bitter and unhappy and resentful and arrogant and hostile, then that proclivity to derogate outgroup members is going to be extremely attractive to me. Mm -hmm. And so if I get my own house in order, well, then I'm less likely to need a target for my unexamined malevolence and violence and more likely to be able to get that intrinsic outgroup, in-group, outgroup differentiation under some modicum of control. Actually, in my psych class today, we were just learning about an experiment where um, kids that were told, you did a really good job this time, they showed significantly less cheating scores than group B, which was told, oh, you're a very smart person. The whole idea was that by complimenting someone's intelligence rather than complimenting their performance, you're reinforcing a fixed mindset attitude rather than a growth mindset attitude. To me, when I looked at that, I just thought about the idea that like you could have someone tell you that the reason why you can't get anywhere in life is because 
you know, someone is oppressing you or putting you in that position. If you say those things, it reinforces a fixed mindset. But I think it will benefit society as a whole to be able to, you know, develop a growth mindset rather than a fixed mindset. There's a difference between like making somebody feel better about themselves and having somebody actually perform. Because you live in the real world, unfortunately, soft words aren't going to cut it. So I've seen power in its multiplicity of manifestations, and I've certainly come out convinced, for example, that there is nothing more powerful than, than truth in the word. That's, mm -hmm. that's the fundamental source of, of a power. Any sort of power that you would actually dare to want. Mm -hmm. you, know, you know what I mean? It's like, do you really want power? Is it, is, what do you mean by that? You want arbitrary authority over other people? Really, you want that? And... It, it, it's interesting. It, it's interesting that you say this because I was just watching, rewatching this conversation between James Baldwin and Nikki Giovanni. And Nikki Giovanni, as, as a young poetess, is grappling with this because her the previous generation was the civil rights generation, and she says, "You guys are so moral, and I'm not. I don't know if I'm interested in morality." Get, like you, she says, "You know the saying, you know, um, gain the whole world but lose your soul." And she's, mm -hmm, Give yeah, me that saying. And she mm -hmm. goes, give me the world. I want the world. And then Baldwin essentially asks her, are you sure you, the, the same question that you're proposing, are you sure you want that kind of power? Do you know what that kind of power does to a person, how it corrupts people and how it causes people to make these very violent, brutal, cruel decisions? Are you sure awesome. you want that kind of power? On the idea of having, you know, huge power, I was thinking about it the other day while reading this book and it was talking about how People have two types of problems, having too little money and the problem of having too much money. Most people experience the having too little money, but so in their mind, it's like, okay, once I have all the money, you know, all my problems are gone. But the people that have a lot of the money too, they have problems with a single bad investment, they could lose all that money. The security is much higher with those people, whether it be financial security, whether it be emotional security. Nobody really talks about those things because people, most people are in under the, the too little money you know category there's two sides to the coin and people see only one side and when they don't see the other side they kind of they make decisions based off of you know i guess the lack of knowledge and insight the way i was looking at it too was um like with more power there's also like more temptation because you know how, like rich, super rich people they end up partaking in like the weirdest like stuff like um child trafficking and then squid games type stuff mm. like gives you the ability to do like just weird stuff that Mm -hmm. Most people mm -hmm. just never have even that opportunity to do. Yeah, and I think just having access to power isn't enough if you don't know how to use the power. That that kind of applies to the idea that you can have power, but it doesn't mean that necessarily you're, you're you know what you're doing with it. Just like you can also have not have power, it doesn't mean that like you're in the place that you are because of not having power. It might just be because of the mindset that you have. That's real. Because because it could just be a lack of power, but you see it as no power. You know what I'm saying? That's real.